Hello, welcome to our latest Facebook Live event. Uh, sorry for the little delay as we were dealing with some uh, technical issues before we uh, got started, but uh, hopefully everything is under control now. Uh, my name is Rashid Clark. I'm a marketing specialist at the Riverwood Conservancy, uh, joined by Dave Taylor uh, for another wonderful talk. I'm sure today we'll be talking about grizzlies and conservation. Uh, just a reminder that uh, Events like this are made possible from people like you and the donations that we receive uh, from the community. So if you are financially able, uh, of course, we would very much appreciate a donation at theriverwoodconservancy.org to keep virtual events like this going and to help our conservation efforts come back strong when we are able to get back into the Riverwood Park once again. Uh, so thanks again for joining us this afternoon. Uh, if you have any questions or comments throughout the presentation, please type them into the comments box. We'll get to uh, as many comments and questions as we can throughout the presentation at the end of Dave's talk. And I will now turn things over to Dave Taylor, wildlife photographer, author of more than 40 books on wildlife and ecology, and the Riverwood Conservancy's education director. Uh, so Dave, I'll throw things over to you. Thanks, Rasheed. And welcome again to another one of these talks. Um, the topic of grizzly bears on a Riverwood site might seem a little odd. However, um, there is a connection and we'll get to it eventually. Last week, the Trump administration in the United States announced that it was no longer going to support the reintroduction of grizzlies into Washington state, I think it was. There are a few grizzlies there. The notion was that after the success of introducing wolves into Yellowstone, reintroducing the grizzlies into uh, Washington would be uh, a good idea. The um, Trump administration, for whatever reason, has decided to cancel that program, uh, largely because of, uh, I guess, reaction from ranchers in the area who did not want grizzlies eating their cattle. And in fact, grizzlies do eat cattle occasionally. So the whole issue of grizzly bears has become really a complex uh, topic. To give you some idea of the animal that we're talking about, I'm going to just hold this up for a second. This is a cast of a grizzly bear track that was made when I took a trip out to Night Inlet in the Glendale River in British Columbia. Uh, Dean Wyatt hosted me there for a week, and part of that was looking at grizzly tracks and having an opportunity to, to create and record a track. Just to give you some idea of how big that is, because I know it's a little distorted, there's my hand. That is a fairly big coastal grizzly, but not by any means huge. And you have to remember this is in mud, so it's probably not as accurate a representation as you might want to see. So Rashid, I think we're gonna to switch to the slides. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we're right into the first slide. All right. So we're gonna to go to the second slide immediately. And I should do that too. So I, I can't see them on the screen, so I'm hoping people can see them. They can. Okay, so the second slide shows bears of North America. Just to give you some perspective on bears, the giant short-faced bear, which is the bear that is grayed out, is extinct. It's been gone for about 13,000 years. The other four bears there are represented, the bears that we currently have. Now, now the smallest of our bears is the black bear. And the black bear is one of only two species of bear found currently in Ontario. The other bear is the white bear at the far end, and that's the polar bear. So those are the two bears that we have in Ontario. There are 1,500 to 2,000 polar bear that live in Ontario, believe it or not. And of course, they're living up in the Georgian Bay, Hudson Bay region of the province. Black bear is a lot more numerous and more common. The two bears in the middle are two types of grizzly bear. Now, they're still classed as the same species versus Arctos, but one is the coastal or the brown bear and the other is the inland grizzly. And the size difference is as you see it. Coastal grizzlies, because they feed on salmon, tend to be much larger. And they tend to be generally browner than the grizzly. The inland grizzly is the one that has the grizzled fur. Now, just to give you some idea of the size of them, I'm gonna to refer to a piece of paper here. A male black bear, which is shown in this picture, weighs up to 300 kilograms. Now, very few get that big. I've seen a few that big in my uh, uh, studies of bears. 
but most of them are well under that. Female black bear weighs up to 79 kilograms. A female black bear would not really outweigh me. Um, it, it's not a very big animal, although you wouldn't want to fight one. And if they were to stand up, a male black bear would stand about as tall as I do, just under two meters. Um, well, probably well under two meters, about less than six feet high. Now the grizzly bear, the inland grizzly bear, is the smallest of the two grizzlies, and they can weigh up to 270 kilograms. In other words, a little bit less than the biggest size for a black bear. But those black bears are really unusual. So most of the time, a grizzly bear is going to be bigger than a black bear in any given location. Female grizzly bears, however, can weigh up to 200 kilograms. Um, again, at the low end of the range, they're, they're still bigger than a female black bear, a large female black bear. And they'll stand up to two meters high, so taller than me for sure. When you get to the brown bear, the brown bear and the polar bear are considered to be the biggest bears in North America and in the world for that matter. So a big brown bear will weigh up to, oh, 680 kilograms. Big polar bear, male, 680 kilograms, very comparable. Polar bears have a slight edge, especially in the female, um, but there's really not much difference. They're both going to stand, and this is what's really impressive, up to three meters high. So nearly twice the height of a black bear. So those are the bears that we have in North America. Next slide, please, Rashid. Done. Okay, and I better go to it because I don't. So let's take a look at the historic range. The yellow that you can see is where the grizzly bears used to be. And you'll notice something a little strange. There's a little bit of yellow showing in the northern tip of Quebec and on Gava and Labrador. And those grizzly bears were there when the first Europeans started to come to trade for furs. At first, they thought they were some strange bear. And nobody really knew what they were. They thought then they must be black bears. It wasn't until just late last century that they actually did some genetic testing and discovered that, they, yep, they were in fact grizzly bears. So during the last ice age, as the ice was pulling back, the grizzly bears range expanded into Ontario and up to almost to the Appalachians and then worked its way up into Quebec. When the ice age ended and forests took over, grizzly bears are not particularly well adapted to forests. The grizzly bear in Ontario died out and in most of the area west of the Mississippi, and that left it where it was. So go to the next slide. Done. You can see in the red, this is the current range of grizzlies. If I wanted to see a grizzly bear, I would go to Yellowstone. The next place I would go would be some places on the coast of British Columbia and up into Alaska. But one of the best places to see brown bears and grizzly or grizzly bears is in Finland. They have a large population there and they're really well adapted. The one of the most surprising locations for grizzly bears is in the central part of Italy. Grizzly bears still survive there and they're doing very well. They have learned to adapt to people. There's only been one case where a grizzly or a brown bear in Italy actually threatened people. And that happened a number of years ago. And it was a bear that had actually been imported from someplace else to bolster the population. And its culture was not the same as the local bears. Since that incident, that bear uh, was removed and so were cubs. And now there have been, there've been no further incidents. Going to the next slide. Okay. This is the current range of the grizzly bear today. The green is the historic range. Again, you can see Quebec and Labrador. Uh, you can see it approaching Ontario. There's only one place in all of North America, in fact, all of the world, where it is possible to see a grizzly bear, a black bear, and a polar bear if you're standing in one spot and looking around. Now, it would be rare, but you can do it just on the where Manitoba and the Northwest ter ter Territories meet. There is a slight overlapping of all three ranges there. What is interesting to me is that the grizzly bear is expanding its range. 
It's certainly doing it down in Yellowstone area, in the Greater Yellowstone Park, but it is also expanding its range along the Hudson's Bay Lowland. And it is possible in the next 10, 20 years that the uh, grizzly bear might once again find its way into Ontario. We have only one fossil record of grizzly bears in Ontario, and that was one from up near Aurelia, and it was at the end of the last ice age, of course. Um, you can see in pink, recent expansion, the grizzly bear is expanding into the Arctic islands. And the other color that I want to draw your attention to is the brown bear. Brown bears are grizzly bears, but if they happen to live in Alaska, they're called brown bears only if they live on the coast. If that same brown bear were to cross the border into British Columbia, it would be considered a grizzly bear. So we'll be using the term grizzly bear throughout the rest of the talk, unless we are specifically referring to bears in Alaska. Next slide. Done. I don't know if you can see this uh, slide, but this is the worldwide population of grizzly bears. Europe has 18,000. Asia has about 80,000. Let's cut it and say 75,000. Next slide. Mm -hmm. North American grizzly bear populations, 67,000. 67,005, half of which are in Alaska, and the other half are in Canada with a very few, 1,500 in the United States. But that United States number is one that we will come back to um, for a bit. British Columbia has got the highest number of grizzly bears in uh, Canada. Okay, going to the next one. If you're hiking in bear country, you're likely to see a bear especially at west, and you'll immediately, if it's kind of brownish in color, think, that's a grizzly. Um, it's really wise to know the difference. So this is a black bear. Black bears lack a shoulder hump. They have taller, more prominent ears than grizzlies. Their face is straighter. They have a sloping backside. And I hope, hope you never get close enough to see it, but their claws are short and dark colored and they're kind of curved because black bears are good tree climbers. Next slide shows you a brownish grizzly bear. Uh, they have a shoulder hump. They have smaller rounded ears. Their face is more dish-shaped. And again, hopefully you'll never get that close. They have longer, lighter colored claws. Their claws are used for digging squirrels out of the ground, not for climbing trees. However, any tree that a human being can climb a grizzly bear can climb. So don't ever think that going up a tree to get to escape a grizzly bear is a good idea. There was a photographer in Yellowstone who tried that. He was using a call, called the grizzly bear in. The bear came closer than he wanted, so he scooted up a tree and the bear scooted up the tree after him. And unfortunately, it did not end well for the photographer. Next slide. Just to confuse matters, this is a picture of just black bears. And you can see on the one side you have a black bear, on the other side you have a white bear. And that is a commodes or spirit bear. Tucked up there in the corner is the little bear that's kind of bluish. That's the glacier bear, only found in a small area of uh, British Columbia and Alaska. And then the other color phases are mostly from out west, something like 95% of all the bears in Ontario are black. And as you go further west, that percentage declines. The reason black bears tend to be black is because black is an excellent color for hiding in the woods. Grizzly bears tend to be brown because they feed in more open country where it's a better camouflage. And black bears live out west, have both types of habitats to choose from. So there you go. The next picture coming up, shows you the color ranges of black or grizzly bears. So you can see some of them are quite dark, almost black. Some of them are blonde. Some of them are a combination. Some of them are the classic grizzle. And, and then there's the polar bear. Now the polar bear, the funny thing is, polar bears are very closely related to grizzly bears. And under certain conditions, such as the ones that are being imposed by, imposed by climate change, grizzly bears and polar bears have been crossbreeding. Now you 
you might think that, oh, well, this is really spectacular and big news. And it is. A prizzle, as they're called, or a grizzle, is um, uh, still rare, but they know from DNA analysis of polar bears that there are many times throughout the existence of polar bears and grizzly bears that they have, in fact, crossbred. So it's not that unusual. And it happens when polar bears, I think, start to enter the grizzly bear country in search of food because polar bears are adapting to their food sources. And one of the food sources they're starting to use is berries. And they will run into grizzly bears under those circumstances. And it's usually a male breeding with a female, male polar, a male grizzly bear breeding with a female polar bear. So if we have information or we have DNA analysis that suggests that it is not that unusual. So going by color, however, is not a good way to identify a bear. Next picture. This is Barry Gilbert, and he's at Night Inlet Lodge. Barry Gilbert is a Canadian. He lived, um, I think, in Kingston. Became a professor, I believe, at the University of Idaho. Has just written a book uh, about his experiences. Uh, you'll notice the patch on the eye. Barry was in Yellowstone and was severely mauled by a grizzly bear. And it was only the presence of a mobile army surgical health unit hospital, a mass unit that was practicing things in Yellowstone that apparently his life was saved. He has since gone on to um, work with grizzly bears across North America, particularly in Katmai, black bears in Yosemite, and bears in Yellowstone. And his book is a really good read and I think it's uh, One of Us is the title of it. And if he's listening to this talk, I apologize if I got it wrong, but I really would recommend it to you. I have met him two or three times in the field and found him just a fascinating fellow to meet with and talk with. These are bears at Night Inlet. So Night Inlet is on the coast of British Columbia. You can go there. It's a tourist attraction and it's an excellent place to illustrate how people are managing bears. The owner of the place when I was there was a man by the name of Dean Wyatt. And Dean took the science of bears in hand. And he was, and Barry was one of the people that was uh, advising him. One of the things they've noticed that bears develop cultures and coastal bears, because they're well fed, tend to also develop a culture where they are very tolerant, next slide please, of other bears. So I'm hoping you're looking at a picture of of a bear and her cub looking up. They're looking up at me. Mm -hmm. um, the And I'm in a platform because that's one of the things that uh, Night Inlet did was it installed platforms for bear watching. And the bears would come in and they, they got used to people and that also became part of their culture. And if the people were very heavily managed, but the bears were no longer afraid of them. They didn't run from them and they performed as natural animals. Next slide, which should be a bear chasing salmon. The bear were there because of the thousands and thousands of uh, salmon uh, that come up into this area to spawn. And because there's so much food there, these bears get really heavy, really content, and they tolerate the close proximity to other, other animals like bears. They still fight. They still growl at each other. Females are still wary of males, but they are there. Next slide. <clears throat> the salmon are just as good after they've died and because they're Pacific salmon, they all spawn out. This is a pink salmon that this grizzly is feeding on. Uh, and if you don't have to chase the fish, why bother? So these bears are quite adept at diving into the water, diving down to depths of, oh, three, four meters. Um, in Barry's book, he mentions that in some parts, they're almost considered marine mammals like polar bears because they're so adept to going into the water. In one case, he documents a case where they're swimming, oh, almost, uh, this sounds incredible, almost 30 kilometers across open water in rough seas to get to nesting seabirds. Next slide. This is a picture of a fisherman working with about a uh, oh, 400 kilogram uh, brown bear. 
the fisherman is not too worried about things. The brown bear is not too worried about him. Uh, the rules are you can't get within, I think it's 50 meters uh, of the animal. And at times in Katmai, it's impossible to avoid that. Katmai is famous for its Brooks Falls. It's an attraction that brings a lot of bears in because the, bear, the fish can't swim up the river here. They have to jump up. And so the bears come and they congregate in the ponds and pools below. Um, they are very social. There's a dominance hierarchy. These are all males. Females do not generally go to the edge of the falls. Some bears are so good at this that they know the place to stand. They stand there and they wait for the fish. The next slide should show a fish jumping into up towards the bear. And then the next slide should show a bear jumping or a fish jumping into the bear's mouth. If you can confirm that, Rashid, that we're on the same picture. We are. Good. Thank you. Um, and that bear actually caught that. And it, you, you see that picture and you think, why, gosh, how did they ever get that picture? Well, you go to Brooks Falls in July or late June, early July, and you get set up on there, the overlook, and you just wait. And it just takes a fairly quick finger. And yeah. The, the bear caught the, pick, the fish. Next slide shows it with the fish in its mouth. And this is another interesting story about bears. It was through the studies of bears and salmon that they realized how important the salmon is to the forest. What we, we call is an energy sink. An energy sink is where energy from one place gets to a place we can't get out of that place. So fish that die in the ocean are an energy sink. They do not do anything for the forest. But when a fish is carried into the forest, that energy goes from where it would have been an energy sink in the ocean to the land. And the reason forests grow so well in British Columbia and Alaska along the coast is because of the huge number of salmon that are transported in there every day by these brown bears and grizzly bears. And they've done studies and they've been able to note isotopes from the fish in the trees. They can tell you that a tree that is close to a bear path is going to grow more robust and quicker. Uh, it's just an amazing story, an amazing relationship between these animals. Next picture. You do occasionally see fights, even though these bears are habituated. They're, June and July are still mating season. Males are not tolerant of each other. And if one bear decides to approach another one's favorite fishing spot, they will attack. Next picture. This is Blondie. The, the bear in the middle of the picture you should be seeing is a female sow. And I was up there with my brother-in-law and we rented a canoe and we were paddling up the Brooks River to yeah, get pictures of bears. And we were coming down and we heard this sound with ah, 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 like that. And that was the sound of these cubs nursing. And we thought this was really cool, but we knew that the female bear with cubs was something you wanted to avoid, so we went around her. We did get a couple of quick shots. You can see Blondie with her head up looking down the river. The next picture should be Blondie and the two cubs on the beach. Now, I am in a canoe with my brother-in-law. I think I was in the back and he was in the front. And we were sitting there taking pictures, feeling we were very safe and a good safe distance from Blondie and her cubs. Next picture, you'll see a couple of uh, canoers come down, Blondie's ignoring them. And then what happened after that, and I don't think there's a picture that shows this because I was a little busy, Blondie walked towards the river. There it is, there's a picture of her walking down. That's the next one. She then came in the river and proceeded to chase the canoe. Now, my brother-in-law and I, back in those days, were pretty good paddlers, and we were going as fast as we could. And Blondie closed the distance, and I have no doubt that she had every intent of tipping the canoe. I don't know why she didn't like us, but at the last moment, she broke off, and then she took those two cubs for a good kilometer and a half swim straight out into the lake and then back to the shore. The next picture should you should see is a picture of a, a blonde bear rug on a display mount. Blondie mm -hmm. was the only bear 
in the 50 or so years that I've been reading about and studying Katmai that ever attacked a person. She attacked a ranger, did not kill her, but she attacked her and was shot. Um, that It's a sad ending to a magnificent bear, but that's the way things go sometimes. Since then, there have been no serious, as far as I'm aware, encounters with people, but people are really well managed there. Now you should see a picture of me standing up above a road in Denali National Park. Denali National Park is a crow flies is about 800 kilometers to a thousand kilometers north due north of Katmai and there are grizzlies there but you don't see 10 20 30 40 bears in a day you might see two or three climbing up to this ridge to photograph doll sheep we didn't see any bears whatsoever we did see some sign grizzly bear in Denali is a much smaller bear you should see one coming up a slope a dark colored one um, these bears are much more wary of other bears and they're warier of people, but they have learned some bad habits. And the next picture shows you how curious the bear gets. This bear came up and decided to investigate somebody watching or filming them and proceeded to eat their camera. Uh, we were on the road, straight behind our cars. We got some really good pictures. The camera guy was less than impressed with it. Next picture. I've been back to Denali several times, and as an author, I was able to get permits to drive my own car and stop and photograph bears, again, following the rules. Generally found these bears much smaller, uh, much more wary of people, um, but beautiful animals, and these animals eat primarily plants. So 80% of their diet is berries and plant food. They will eat the occasional ground squirrel. And you can imagine that doesn't hold much compared to a fish. And they will eat the occasional caribou that they're lucky to catch it, or if a wolf kills it and they can steal it. They are more social than people think. Bears are tended to be thought of as solitary animals, but they do have a society and they will tolerate each other. In this case, it's a female with an almost growing cub. The cub would be about three years old. Next picture you should see is a picture of a ground squirrel. And that is one of the, that's a treat for the bears. And the next shot, we're going to Yellowstone. And this is a bear jam. And you can see all these people out there photographing whatever it is that's crossing the road. And you can bet it's a bear. The fellow that's looking backwards is what looking for the cubs. Fellow, the next person in the picture with the silver hair, the white hair, is the fellow that I often go shooting with. And I'll tell you a story about him later on, but I'm not going to identify him for legal reasons, as you'll see. This is what they're waiting for. This is a female grizzly. And the rangers were there and they split us into two uh, groups of photographers. Uh, they were, we were about, um, oh, 50 meters apart. And this sow with her two cubs walked right between us. The story of Yellowstone's grizzlies is very different from the story of Katmai's grizzlies. Grizzlies now are expanding their range in Yellowstone. In 1970, 1972, there's a story in the National Geographic saying they're killing Yellowstone's grizzlies. It was written by the Craigheads who pioneered grizzly bear research in North America, really. And in 1970, I think it was, it was decided that all of the garbage dumps would be closed in Yellowstone. Now those garbage dumps were like the fish up in Alaska. They attracted a lot of bears and the bears were very tolerant of each other. When they closed them, the parks people assumed the bears would just start eating natural foods. Well, that's not what happened. The bears went to the next best food source, which was to quote Yogi Bear, the Picnic Browns. And these bears were learning to rob the ranger or the picnickers of their food. Well, that was an intolerable situation. And about half the grizzly bears were shot. And then they kind of learned and the culture came and then you didn't see grizzlies. I mean, years of going to grizzly bears, see grizzlies in Yellowstone from 72 until 2003. I think I saw two or three. Now I was confined to going to the summers. However, 
Since then, the grizzly bear population has expanded and the introduction of wolves has really increased it. Now, they gave them protection under the Endangered Species Act in 1975, I think. And under that, they can no longer be shot or hunted. And if you killed one, you had to have a really good reason for doing it. Now, you should be looking at a big male bear uh, in a snow patch at this picture. Um, hopefully, you're there. Uh, the grizzly bears were expanding their range, but they're expanding their numbers. Then the wolves came in, and they started to provide an extra food source because the wolves would kill uh, an elk, and the grizzly bears would steal the elk. And because of that, the grizzly bear numbers started to increase. And as the wolf range expanded, the grizzly range expanded. I'm not sure the two were correlated. So the next picture you should see is a grizzly feeding on a dead elk. Um, this is in the spring. It's a winter killed animal. And the bear is just out of hibernation and feeding on it. But as a result of this changes in attitude, changes in the law, what has happened is the grizzly bear population went from 275 to well over, well, probably approaching up to 800 if you count the cubs this year. And their range is expanding. My wife and I were driving back from shooting pictures in um, the Black Hills and we stopped at a place on our way back to your Yellowstone out in the prairies where you never think bears would be seen. Stopped at a restaurant and I just happened to ask the, the waitress, do you ever see grizzly bears around here. Oh yeah, there's two in town right now. Now they were a good 150 miles from the protected area. So bears are starting to expand the range and may once again finally make them way down to Colorado where they've been absent for almost 100 years, which should be a great thing. And I, But I guess ranchers would disagree with that. The next picture shows a coyote approaching the grizzly bear. Grizzly bears are part of an ecosystem. They are part of a healthy ecosystem. If you've got grizzly bears and wolves, you know that the ecosystem is very healthy. And given their own resources, they seem to be capable of restoring and reclaiming some of their lost areas. Grizzly bears and wolves that's been shown due to the predation on elk have helped the elk herd become a much healthier herd. And actually, the presence of these large predators is helping animals get through climate change because there's more food available to a smaller number of ungulates. Uh, it is working to the advantage of the whole ecosystem. And if the ungulates numbers go down, the elk population goes down, the grizzly bear population will decline as well. Next picture shows bear number 399. You cannot talk about bears today without talking about 399. She is world famous. She, I think she's still alive. She was, when I took this picture a year and a half ago, she was a very old bear to have cubs. But 399 is a gem. Um, Thomas Magluson has written a book about her. It's an excellent book. Um, she is the poster girl for well-behaved grizzly bears. The Part, this is the Grand Teton well-managed park. Um, she is the reason that grizzly bears are not going to be allowed to be hunted in the Western states anytime soon. Not entirely, but well-known bears, if they wander outside of the park and were shot by hunters, that would be a disaster for the hunting and guiding uh, economy. And we know that because of Clarence, or uh, whatever, I think that was the name of the lion. I may be mistaken. But you will remember a few years ago, a famous lion was shot in Africa, legally shot. Guy posed with it. Well, the stuff hit the fan, literally, over that. And it wasn't too long after that that an intrepid hunter in British Columbia shot and wounded a grizzly bear that slid down a a snowy slope and left a trail of blood behind it. And he posted it. And that ended grizzly bear hunting in British Columbia. British Columbia had been under pressure to end the grizzly bear hunt. And when I was at uh, Dean Wyatt's place, uh, 
to, to do a story on bears. I was working for a magazine that was essentially a wildlife magazine in Canada, but its funding was from hunting. And because Dean was adamantly against grizzly bear hunting, the article was killed and it was never published. But that pressure, that tourism pressure to see grizzly bears continued to mount. And they did studies and grizzly bears bring in more money as a tourist attraction than they ever did as a hunting attraction. And so given the, the changes in the rules down in the states where grizzly bear hunting is not allowed, it's still protected species. And given the adverse publicity about this one grizzly in British Columbia that got killed, British Columbia ended grizzly bear hunting in 2017. And I, th I think that's a good thing. I think the tourism industry to go see bears out there is alive and well and doing very, very strong business. Next picture is a cub playing. The opportunity to see cubs in Yellowstone playing. Yellowstone used to work up the bears. They did a lot of research on them. They radio collared them. And honestly, when you sat around with a bunch of bear photographers, as I've done many times, the, the thought was the grizzly bears were in Yellowstone were just cantankerous because they were worked up so much. Whereas bears in Denali, which had never been darted or collared, were very gentlemanly in their behaviors. And I think there's some truth to that. Over the years, Yellowstone has adapted a similar approach. They still occasionally radio collar grizzlies, but for the most part, they um, are letting them be and they manage them so that people can see them. And the female bears have learned to bring their cubs close to the road because the big male bears don't like to be close to the road. So if you go in the spring, you have a really good chance of finding uh, good sightings of grizzlies with cubs. A really good chance. And the next picture should show 399 nursing her cubs. She is a spectacular bear, uh, just uh, an incredible, um, I think conservationists, bear lovers anyhow, owe her a real grant of gratitude. <laughs> I'm getting my words mixed. A real debt of gratitude. And uh, she is a wonderful bear. The next picture shows her and her cubs about to head into the woods. And I want to end up with one story about another reason why you see grizzlies by the road in Yellowstone. Elk have learned that if they calve near the road, they're not going to have the same predation pressure from wolves and, and grizzly bears and black bears. So they tend to have their calves close to the road. Now an elk calf, because it's spotted, most spotted deer like elk and white-tailed deer uh, fawns are hiders. So mom leaves the calf hidden and goes off and feeds. And she never goes more than say 100, 150 meters from her. But the grizzly bears know that these calving areas are happening. And because it's safer for the grizzly bear and safer for the elk to be near the road, the grizzly bears come. So you should be seeing a picture of a calf hidden down. The next picture shows mother grizzly bear coming along. She's got two cubs that aren't in the picture. She sniffs out the calf and the calf runs for its life, and if it had been just a few days older, it would have made it. And the next picture shows mother and sows or cubs feeding on the remains of the calf. Now, it sounds tragic and kind of sad, but the grizzly bear has a right to live. And this is like 20% of her diet. And there are 13,000 elk and less than, oh, 750 grizzly bears in this particular ecosystem. The balance is certainly in the elk's favor. And I don't begrudge the grizzly its one meal. Um, my wife sat in the car and didn't watch this, but oh well. And this bear, and this is where I get back to that story about the fell. We were in Yellowstone and we saw a bear way off and it was up quite a steep hill. And this was before I had my heart attack, but not much before. And so my friend and I climbed up the hill. Well, while we were climbing up the hill, this bear was climbing down the hill. And we got to the top, and there this bear was, ambling along towards us. And I was just catching my breath. My good buddy decided there was a better place down the road to get, get his picture from. So he left me. He left me. Now, the joke is 
you always go hiking with somebody that you can outrun. Unfortunately, in this case, I was the person that could be outrun. So I'm standing there alone. My friend has gone down. And to make matters worse, he takes the car and drives about a mile up the road. This bear is approaching me. I thought, well, I can't run because if I run, he's going to attract his attention. So I stood there very still, took a few pictures, and then I spoke to the bear, let him know I was there, and the bear walked by. And that's not the bear that most people would think. You would think I would be dead in a doornail. And then I walked down the hill, walked the mile to my buddy, and I didn't mention the incident. Oddly enough, I think we both knew about it, because in the past few years, we've laughed about it many times. But at the time, it wasn't so funny. And finally, the last picture is a bear going over the hill, and that's as good a place to end the slideshow as any. So Rashid, we'll take some questions if we have time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Dave, thanks so much for that. Uh, appreciate your time once again. And uh, yes, apologies for the less than ideal setup with the uh, slides today, but uh, I think we were able to get through it uh, pretty well uh, with me working with the uh, slides from the background. Uh, oh, really so Dave, Thank you. Oh, of course, uh, but we'll try to make it even sleeker next time around. Uh, but uh, thanks again for the presentation, Dave, and thanks to everyone for watching and uh, commenting. Just a couple of uh, comments off the top of, first of all, from Shane, uh, who was very impressed with the photos that were uh, shown throughout. So thanks very much, Shane. And from Jeff and Steph Pearson, uh, super fascinating, uh, favorite online presentation to date. You're too kind. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll have even more impressive presentations as we go along. And yes, at the beginning of the presentation, uh, we had some good uh, IDing tips from Dave uh, to help you identify uh, particular types of bears. Uh, on the topic of the, the uh, photography, uh, we did have uh, one question from uh, Renee asking, what type of lens uh, are you using when you're photographing the bears? I guess it might vary from uh, situation to situation, but uh, can you give a little more information on the lens situation? Generally speaking, the longest lens that I have, I would use, which is a 500 millimeter with a two times teleconverter and so on and so forth. However, honestly, most of the pictures were taken with a 100 to 400 zoom, sometimes with a 1.4 teleconverter. I have had grizzly bears uh, as close to me as, uh, well, arm's length away. Um, one time in uh, Alaska, my brother-in-law were up there and suddenly uh, we saw these two bears running along a male chasing a female. We got out of the car and stopped. Lo and behold, the bears changed direction and one, the female, darted by me and then the male came by. I could have petted him. As he ran by, he looked at me like, what are you doing here? And then kept going. And obviously, I'm not as attractive as a female bear, something I am eternally grateful for. Um, but uh, most of the time, a long telephoto lens. In Yellowstone, most of the bears that you see are going to be a distance off, so you need a telephoto. It's only when they're crossing the roads uh, that you tend to get them very close. So long telephoto, and often with the long telephoto is a tripod. And a tripod is really useful for bears because the one thing that bears respond to is size. So if I hold a telephoto or a tripod over my head, I look a lot bigger than I do. You don't want to crouch down near a bear, any bear. So that has been a benefit. But yeah. And so we've, uh, we've, I noticed in one of the uh, earlier photos that you showed the, uh, the group of photographers uh, by the roadside and the grizzly that uh, was walking right past them. Again, not very far away. So is that common that bears will get that close to people and just kind of carry on their way? In Yellowstone, it, uh, with both black and grizzly bears, it has become more common in the last decade and a half because they're managing the bears with people. What you don't see is uh, the ranger or a park naturalist who is there enforcing that. They have very strict rules. Um, and the bears have learned that people are not dangerous. And as long as you stay on the road, if you were to go off hiking after them, it could be a different story, but uh, yeah, it's fairly common. And you notice in that picture, there's guys there with big lenses. They got nothing. They can't take a picture because that bear is is too close. 
Uh, so the 100 to 400 was a perfect lens. That's how I got the shot of the people in the in the bear in one shot. Um, and I always carry two cameras, something usually three, one with a long lens, but it's always the middle lens, the 100 to 400, almost always that I use for that kind of shooting. And uh, one last question, I guess maybe a good way to kind of wrap things up for today is, you know, when people are out hiking or photographing and, you know, there's a bear nearby, I think, you know, people have heard lots of different uh, ideas of what they should do in that situation. But if, uh, you know, if confronted uh, by a bear or if there's a bear near you when you're out in the wilderness, is there a best practice for how to handle that situation? Yeah. Um... First of all, read Stephen Herrero's book, Bear Attacks or Causes and Avoidance. Uh, but basically, you gotta know which bear. If you lie down and curl up in the fetal position and you do that so that you're protecting your, your soft stomach area and your neck and your brain, um, you're giving the bear something to chew on. But if you can do that with a grizzly bear, you probably survive because most attacks by a grizzly bear are because they wanna get rid of you. Now, you got to remember how big this paw was. One hit with that paw and you could be done. But he probably isn't going to feed on you. Unfortunately, with black bears, they're not so uh, picky. They will sometimes eat you. So with a black bear curling up into a ball lying on the ground and lying still and playing dead isn't the way you want to go. You, you want to stand up to the bear. You want to keep your eyes on it because they really are reluctant to attack if you can see they can see you're looking at them. They like it when you turn your back on them. And then you, you talk to them and you walk away or you get aggressive. Most black bears, most grizzly bears will respond to that. A grizzly bear is more likely to come at you than a black bear. But a grizzly bear is more likely to do that simply to eliminate what it sees as a threat once that threat's gone. So um, you, you, you sort of temper in Ontario, never lie down for a bear because it's just black bears, unless you're up with polar bears. And don't lie down with polar bears because they like people you know, for dinner. Um, grizzly bears, fine. But in Ontario, black bears, stand up, keep your eye on them. I make myself look big. I talk to the bear. Sometimes I yell at the bear. Sometimes I'll even take a few steps towards the bear if it's not a dangerous bear. If it is, if I sense any sense that this is a dangerous bear, I keep my eye on it and I will back away. I've only, in all my life, and I've photographed a lot of bears and as people probably know, I've written some books on bears. Uh, I've only had one bear that was seriously intent on doing me physical harm. And that was in Algonquin Park many, many years ago. Uh, and I got in the car and the bear just went on by. And it had just been in a fight. I've never run into a predatory black bear um, but when they want you, they just keep coming. It's like John Wayne and he's angry at you. He's, they're sauntering up to you and I'm going to eat you, mister. And there's not much you can do except fight, back away, run into the water. And as we found with the, that one grizzly, they swim really well. So. <laughs> well some, so some words of wisdom and uh, some parting information. And of course, we hope that uh, you never have to uh, put any of those tips into practice uh, in your in your walks, uh, hikes, or uh, uh, photography adventures. So, uh, thanks everyone for joining us again today. And Dave, thank you for another excellent uh, presentation. Uh, we do have more presentations on the way, uh, both uh, some additional Facebook Live events coming up and a few webinars uh, specifically on bird photography coming up. Uh, so, to learn more about our next set of online events, just head over to our website the riverwoodconservancy.org and you can see all the events that we have coming up and while you're on our website of course we would very much appreciate a donation of any amount that you're able to give right now uh, so that we can uh, continue to keep virtual education like this going and so that we can come back strong when we're able to resume our conservation work in the park uh, when we can get back into Riverwood. Uh, so Dave thank you again for your time and our expertise today and uh, for everyone joining us Thanks again for watching and stay safe. We'll see you soon.